Thank you very much, everyone, for uh, inviting me to present today um, on the development of blood impressions. Um, as was mentioned, I've been in the field of forensics for approximately uh, 16 years now, uh, moving through some of the major metro areas on the East Coast of the United States. And while I've been primarily um, one of the senior examiners within the laboratory, I've also had some tremendous experience in uh, performing a lot of uh, crime scene responses from a laboratory perspective, because sometimes with latent impressions, we're developing these impressions that are in mediums other than your traditional latents that require more than just uh, fingerprint powders for development and recovery. And often uh, with my experience, I would be called into the violent crime scenes um, that would often happen, uh, specifically homicides where you'd have the potential for the development of blood impressions. And within the laboratory environment itself and with uh, the various crime scene responses that can occur, there's a lot of different development techniques that can be performed. And some people are familiar with and others uh, not so much. Um, and as I'll go through uh, a number of different techniques uh, here with you, um, many of them have what I always talk about as lanes. Um, when we were talking about the sequential development of latent impressions on physical evidence um, that we're either going to be lifting or photographing for further examination, one of the biggest uh, keys that we have to consider is contrast. We want to develop contrast between our friction ridge impressions and the background. It allows us to uh, perform our suitability determinations on whether something should be recovered or not, um, allows us to visualize um, not only the pattern types, but our level two and three detail to make those assessments on quality and quantity uh, to the very best of our ability. And while some impressions, uh, especially photographs, um, can be further developed in a digital enhancement program, whether that's something like Adobe Photoshop, or one of the um, uh, digital imaging databases that are commercially available to laboratories, um, we want to be able to um, go into our, our development process uh, knowing what um, reagents are gonna develop, how they're gonna be visualized, and what our recovery methods are gonna be. And there are some alternative methods to what um, are traditionally used within the laboratory. And there is some background to this. When I was with the NYPD laboratory, um, we were getting a lot of items that weren't giving us a lot of contrast with the reagents that we had available to us. So we did do some research and validation studies on a couple of the reagents that I'm gonna talk about today um, that did give us another avenue. They did give us another opportunity for the development process that gave us the visualization and also develop the contrast that we were um, looking for. Um, the blood reagents that are available uh, commercially that um, we're using in, in my laboratory and have for a while now are amido black, leucocrystal violet, acid fusion, or also known as Hungarian red, and then floxine B and acid yellow seven. And these are the reagents that I'm gonna speak about today. When we talk about amido black and leucocrystal violet, um, these are dye stains that are sensitive to the heme proteins found in blood. And they are very, very sensitive. Both are dark colored reactions. So the overall visualization um, after the reaction occurs is going to be dark in nature. So that's gonna be your contrast factor that you need to think about when using these. Uh, one difference between these two, is leucocrystal violet does have a slight fluorescent property. So it can give you a different avenue for your visualization uh, within the, uh, the development process. Both of these are two-step applications. Uh, when I talk about the two-step um, application methods with these reagents, I'm basically referring to a spray and rinse um, where you apply the chemical and you rinse with a distilled water uh, solution and the reaction is pretty much instantaneous. So it does give you a nice um, 
visualization quickly. Uh, with Hungarian red, also known as uh, acid fusion, it's another blood stain that's sensitive to the heme proteins. Uh, within the blood development reagents, that's going to kind of be the theme to all of these reagents. Uh, that's the target matrix that they're developing is the proteins found in blood. Hungarian red is also a two-step process. Um, however, it develops a very different color. Its visualization is pink or red. It kind of looks almost like a, like a red juice or Kool-Aid or fruit punch, something like that, um, uh, both the solution and its final development. Um, it does have a, also a fluorescent property, which gives you, again, that added um, option for the visualization of this, um, this reagent. And one of the really nice characteristics of Hungarian red is it can be lifted using a white gel lift or white um, gelatin lifter. Um, when the application is completed and the lift is put on, it's allowed to sit and it absorbs the actual dye itself. So if you have multicolored surfaces, textured surfaces, um, those conditions that might impede the clarity of your photographs, that aspect of being able to lift your impressions um, is really a great benefit uh, to this reagent itself. Uh, with acid yellow and fluoxine B, um, again, they're reacting with the proteins in blood. Um, again, that's the theme of all of these different reagents. Um, the one change is acid yellow seven is a multi-step fluorescence theme. And I'll go into some detail about that in a few minutes. Uh, Floxine B is also a two-step red stain. It's another one that has that pink red development, sort of like Hungarian red does. So they, these techniques do differ from amido black and leucocrystal violet, which we kind of uh, call our traditional techniques. Most laboratories, um, have amido black as their standard blood reagent. Uh, some have leucocrystal violet, especially for the development of bloody footwear impressions. Um, however, sometimes you need that different visualization, that different development uh, color for the contrast. So when we have various items that may come into the laboratory or that are found at crime scenes, um, something like the black knife handle that has some texture to it, um, darker surfaces, dark leathers, plastic trash bags, things of that nature. If you're limited on your blood reagents or the techniques that you have available to you, you may not be able to fully develop the contrast with these types of impressions to be able to make your assessments uh, and collect and recover uh, impressions from these types of surfaces. Um, breaking into them a little bit further with amido black, again, it's that sensitive to the heme protein group. It's the two-step process. Um, when you encounter an impression such as the photograph on the top, um, that's when you're going to be thinking about using a blood impression. You have potential blood stains um, and the chemical is applied and rinsed off and the development is blue-black in color such as the photograph on the bottom, which is post um, photograph post-development. Uh, acid yellow seven, it's a fluorescent protein dye. So it's very unique in its application method. It has a completely different visualization than any of the other techniques that we will talk about. Um, it will fluoresce between 400 and 495 nanometers and an orange barrier filter. Um, thinking about the color of light versus our color of our filters in the application of the color wheel, um, dictates this relationship. With acid yellow seven, it is a three-step process. So the first step is a blood fixative. Um, commercially, we use a lot of commercial reagents in, in my laboratory, so we purchase everything pre-made. So our fixative solution is 5-sulfosalicylic acid. And basically, you would take uh, some filter paper, uh, Kim wipe, something that's kind of sensitive um, uh, and is not going to damage your item or damage the impression. And simply start by applying the solution to the corner of the item and lay your paper across as you continue to wet the item itself so that uh, you uh, 
do not capture any air bubbles underneath of the, uh, the paper that you're using so that you can be ensured that the fixative solution is remaining in contact with your surface throughout the process. And you're gonna let this fixative solution work for about three to five minutes. If you have a heavier blood stain, you're gonna extend this exposure um, because it is a heavier stain. We want that sulfur salicylic acid to be able to penetrate through uh, the, the blood stain that's present and allow that fixative process uh, to complete. The second step is the application of the stain uh, where you're gonna um, either cover the stain if you can, if it's a small item such as in the photograph, um, we use it a lot in the laboratory to process firearms. If there is a potential bloody friction ridge impression on a firearm. And in those cases, again, we'll use a filter paper, a Kim wipe, even a soft paper towel, uh, whatever's available and uh, soak that in the dye and wrap it around the item itself and continue to wet the, um, the paper to ensure that the dye is being absorbed. Um, that it's in constant contact with those impressions. Um, typically, your development will occur within one to three minutes. Uh, personally, I would recommend extending that because the longer the exposure, the more, um, the stronger the visualization will be, the stronger the fluorescence will be uh, upon um, the visual examination. And a final step is the rinse of the excess dye. Um, there's two versions. Uh, if you do um, mix the acid yellow seven, there's the formulation that would be used for the rinse or simply distilled water can be used, um, which is much more readily available. Um, that's what we use with our pre-made versions, um, but both will work. And the final visualization is fluorescence. Um, again, between 400 and 495 nanometers using an orange goggle or orange barrier filter. Um, acid yellow seven can also be lifted. Kind of what I was mentioning with Hungarian red. Uh, this time we're gonna be looking at using a black gel lift. Um, and again, it's because of contrast. When we have a fluorescent yellow impression uh, on a dark background, we can achieve that wonderful level of contrast. Uh, whereas if this fluorescence was on a white gel lift, uh, we would not, we would be limited in our visualization. It would not be as um, strong of a fluorescence to the background. Uh, with fluoxine B, um, it's a biological derivative of fluorescin. Uh, it's also a protein dye. So again, we're still working on that theme of all of these reagents, their target matrix is the uh, proteins found within blood. When the reaction is complete, it is gonna look kind of pink or red. Uh, so it does give some contrast to the darker backgrounds. So you can see in the top uh, photograph, we're on a black plastic bag. Um, we are able to visualize the ridges um, and the characteristics much better than we would it using something like Amido Black, where we would have that blue black development on a black background. We would not have the contrast um, that we would be looking for. Um, another really nice feature of Floxine B, and this is why it's honestly one of my favorites, is if you use your just white light, your flashlight, and you shine it on your impression at more of an oblique angle, it'll actually reflect the light and it'll almost look silver. Um, I always say it kind of looks like aluminum foil, uh, something like that. Um, so it does reflect the light and again, gives some fantastic contrast uh, to the backgrounds itself. Floxine B is also a two-step process, so it is spray and rinse, uh, much like Amido Black. Um, I didn't mention it earlier, but with Leuco Crystal Violet, uh, typically with the commercial versions now, it is a, um, a one-step process. It comes in three parts that are uh, mixed together to make the stock solution. And it's applied using kind of a pump sprayer. And when the mist comes into contact with the, the blood, it develops instantly and uh, appears purple. And you wanna make sure that as soon as you start to develop those impressions that you stop applying the leucocrystal violet because it will start to um, 
kind of bleed out, it will um, obscure some of the detail. Uh, with Phylloxine B, we're going to be spraying it. Um, if you're in the laboratory, um, you would do these things under a fume hood. However, these chemicals are also um, very safe to use at a crime scene as well. And again, we're using just distilled water to allow for the, uh, the rinse. Um, Phylloxine B must be photographed. This is not a reagent that can be lifted, unlike uh, Hungarian red and acid yellow seven. And again, our development color, that visualization is going to be that red um, kind of orange color um, or the silver from using your light at different angles. Uh, looking at a little closer with Phylloxine B, because most people are not so familiar with this re uh, reagent, uh, the development must be photographed. Um, and it's going to, your photograph is going to rely heavily on your lighting techniques. Um, again, we have, if you're developing on a dark background, such as black plastic or um, a dark painted wall, something like that, uh, the, the dark knife handles, um, firearms, things of that nature, um, the visualization is pink. So we do have pink on black, which does have some nice contrast in and of itself. But in using your light at different angles, um, we can potentially get that silver colored reflection, which gives a whole nother dynamic uh, to the development itself. And as another example of the reflective property, um, this is an impression that was on an amber bottle, a glass bottle. Um, the photograph on the bottom is just transmitted lighting uh, where the light is placed behind the surface um, and shown straight through toward the camera. Oops, go back. And the photograph at the top is that reflective property again, where the light is used um, at a different angle. And you can see there's a lot more detail visible um, in the top photograph than the bottom, and it's just using light. Um, generally speaking, with latent print processing and development, uh, light can really be your best friend. Uh, just changing the angles of light allows the matrix or the development um, of your reagents to look very different. And if you can visualize it using lights in certain angles, you can photograph it and capture it using those same exact uh, conditions. So uh, when we talk about things such as evidentiary photography, um, basically, if you can see it, you can photograph it. We just have to replace our eye with the lens. So using lights in different angles is really a key to all aspects of latent print processing and development. Uh, to show an example, um, with Acid Yellow 7, here we have the knife handle. Um, there is some texture to this handle. Um, upon our visual examination using um, what would be our initial step in the sequential process, just using our regular ambient light, um, we can see that there is a blood-like stain. That's what I mean by BLS. Um, because in the laboratory, we do not do any confirmatory tests or anything of that nature on these stains. We always just refer to them as possible blood, blood-like stains, reddish-brown stains, things like that. Uh, based on the actual knife handle itself with the textures that are present and the curvatures, um, it's really impossible to see any ridge detail. Even using um, ultraviolet light um, and different lighting techniques, um, just in a visual sense, um, we really can't see any friction ridge detail present on this item. Uh, following the treatment of the acid yellow seven staining process, we can start to see that development occurring. Um, it may be a little hard to see on the screen, but if you look in the center of that knife handle, you can start to see uh, the impression develop. Uh, the ridges and the furrows, there are characteristics present. Um, much better than just using traditional lighting methods. In comparing these, um, the photograph on the left is the one taken as is, as development occurred, um, photographed at 455 nanometers and an orange filter. The photograph was enhanced in Adobe Photoshop, just using some basic channels and converted to grayscale. And then we're able now to compare this print to our known exemplar. 
And this is a situation where a lot of the traditional blood techniques may not have given you the opportunity to conduct any further examinations due to the fact we were limited on our visualization. We were not able to develop the contrast. But in looking at this as a fluorescent impression, here we can see the comparison, and I know it's a little tough to see the, the annotations on the, the known print on the right, um, but believe me, it is an, a legitimate identification. Um, I know that because it's my finger. Um, so we are able to see that there's um, enough detail present that corresponds with each other that we can arrive at the conclusion of an identification. With Hungarian red, um, this is used on the dark surfaces. Uh, again, it has that pink red development um, from its visualization. So it does give that different uh, colored contrast to our backgrounds. It can also fluoresce under 515 to 516 nanometers and a red filter. Again, thinking about the color wheel properties, our color of light has shifted uh, more into the cyan green uh, range uh, from the color of light. So opposite of that on the color wheel is red. And that's what allows us to block the ambient light and allow the fluorescence to penetrate our barrier filters. Um, as I mentioned previously, Hungarian red can be lifted using a white gel lift, uh, where the gel lift is placed on top of the developed impression and allowed to sit and the dye is absorbed into the gel lift. Uh, when they are being lifted, again, it's a white gel lift, not a black gel lift. And it is a, you're gonna have to let the, the lift sit on top of the impression for approximately 20 minutes uh, to allow for the dye stain to be absorbed properly into your, your gel lift. You also must photograph it and you must photograph it quickly. Uh, the longer the uh, dye is allowed to sit on the gel lift, it will continue to disperse throughout the lift itself. So you'll start to obscure some of those minute characteristics, obviously beginning with the level three details, uh, moving if you have incipient ridges, they may start to obscure. And ultimately our level two characteristics are also gonna become uh, more unreliable for the comparative purposes. So if you do develop an impression and you are able to lift it, you wanna take a photograph of that impression as quickly as possible. Just like with any opaque lifter, we also have to laterally reverse the photograph uh, because it's not lifted in the same way as uh, something like fingerprint tape where we can see through the mechanism that uh, we're lifting with, we have to do the lateral reversal in order for anatomical orientation to be correct. In considering the five techniques that I've uh, been speaking about, there are a couple of comparative considerations. Uh, one is acid yellow seven is that multi-step process. Your environment, your situation must be conducive to the fixative, the stain and the rinse. Um, so there may be limitations for a crime scene response on acid yellow seven. Uh, if you have a light colored background, amido black and leuco crystal violet are going to develop dark. So they're gonna give you that um, that contrast between your impression and the background itself. Hungarian red and phloxene B both develop pink and red. So they'll have that different aspect of contrast um, as your goal. Uh, they will have a very different visualization. You also have the reflective property of phloxene B. Um, we've seen it a lot of times in the laboratory situations that that reflective property actually ends up being the one that gives you the best result uh, because you're able to uh, really highlight the ridges and uh, visualize the individual characteristics that are present. Uh, Hungarian red is also a fluorescent technique. So you have two different ways you can visualize that reagent in addition to the lifting. Um, aspect. Um, and amido black, leuco crystal violet, phloxene B, and Hungarian red, they're all very easy to use. They're basically spray and rinse. Um, the overall reagents themselves 
typically are aqueous based. So there's no real safety considerations, which will come in handy uh, when you would use these during a crime scene response. There's no special safety protocols that would have to be followed. Um, and using them at a crime scene. And again, this is where a lot of times um, these types of impressions do get overlooked a bit. Um, this, the development of blood impressions is actually how I got my start in crime scene investigation um, because I was responding from a laboratory perspective. These are all reagents that we had available to us in the laboratory, but our crime scene unit did not have available to them. So they would often call for some advice or a consultation on a blood impression that's been discovered because the typical protocol was to pull out a saw and cut out the wall and send the wall to the laboratory. Well, that can often, the, uh, the wall can crack, things can happen. Um, so it's better to process on scene. So through some education and training, we were able to show a lot of the investigators how to use these techniques, but often they would still call us out um, in order to develop many of these types of impressions on scene. Um, when we're talking about uh, the development of blood impressions on crime scenes, um, like I said, acid yellow seven may not be able to give you the results that you're looking for uh, for a couple of reasons. One, that multi-step uh, application. Uh, you may not be able to apply it to something like a wall or um, some different aspects within your crime scene. It does take some time for the development to occur. And because it's only visual uh, under ALS conditions, you also need to have a dark environment. So there are some different variables that need to be considered. Um, however, there is a lot of tech, a lot of situations where um, Floxine B, Hungarian Red could benefit you. Um, one of the first examples that I had where I used, um, it was Floxine B to develop some bloody planter impressions or bloody friction ridge impressions from the foot was actually at a homicide scene where there was dark green tile on the floor. Um, I needed something that was gonna give me that contrast and Amido Black was not going to work. So I was able to um, perform the development with Floxine B and get some good photographs. Um, that's not to say that Amido Black and Leuco Crystal Violent can't remain to be the standards. They work very, very well. They're very sensitive. Um, most people's homes uh, and the, uh, the scenes that at least I've responded to, um, most of them have lighter surfaces that would uh, call for these techniques to be used. Uh, if you're developing blood impressions on walls, things of that nature, most people's homes have lighter colored walls. Um, they're not painting their walls black or navy blue or anything like that. So that type of contrast um, would work very well. There's also no special disposal requirements. So again, when you're thinking about safety um, at a crime scene, when you spray and rinse, it's running down the wall to the floor. That's about it. That puddle of reagent can remain there um, until someone comes in to clean up. Uh, there's no fumes, uh, no safety considerations. It's not flammable things of that nature. Um, and again, we have to be able to capture these through photographic means. Um, especially at a crime scene, only Hungarian red can be lifted. Uh, so we would need to be able to photograph these impressions as they're developed. So the knowledge of those evidentiary photography techniques is gonna be very important. You can also use these techniques in processing a horizontal surface. Most of the time we think about spraying uh, items under a fume hood in the laboratory, um, processing the walls in a room, uh, doors, things of that nature. But again, a few of those uh, bloody footwear impressions, planter impressions, tire marks even, um, they can be uh, processed uh, horizontally. And the way it's performed is by applying the chemical to an area outside of the impression uh, that you're focusing on. And then taking either that filter paper, um, the chem wipe, the laboratory um, 
wipe, uh, something again that's kind of light in nature. We're just gonna kind of drag it through uh, and over the impression from multiple angles. So sort of paint it um, all over. And through that, we will develop the impression. You'll be able to see it happen because these reactions do happen very quickly. Um, we're gonna follow it up with that distilled water rinse in the same way, using that same type of paper, dragging it through, and it kind of cleans up your impression, gets the excess um, solutions away, and we're left with uh, strictly the impression itself. Just as some examples that I've processed, um, throughout my career on uh, some horizontal surfaces as well. Um, top left, we have a, a shoe impression. Uh, top right is actually the ball of a foot. That's a planter impression. Uh, the bottom left is a fingerprint on a door frame. And finally, a, a bloody fingerprint that was left on a light switch cover. Um, I'd also just like to finish off real quick if anyone has any questions. Uh, to let me know. Um, but you can also reach me uh, through my company website at Delta Forensics. Um, we're also on Facebook. Uh, 